Dragon's Dogma is a single-player, narrative-driven action RPG that lets players choose their own experience. From character customization, your class or vocation as the game calls it, your party, how to approach different situations and more. It's coming to PlayStation, Xbox and PC on March 22nd, so I set out to discover just why Dragon's Dogma 2 is so hype within the community and found myself getting a lot more pumped than I expected. So take the journey with me as I go through everything you need to know about Dragon's Dogma 2. First, the algorithm has been really bad since I took a two year break, so if you could help me out by letting the video run, liking, subbing, and even saying hi on Twitter or Discord, you'll be making the gaming gods happy or, or something along those lines. All right, let's begin. Dragon's Dogma 2 starts with the main antagonist, a dragon, taking and consuming your heart. Though lore-wise, it's the same setting as Dragon's Dogma 1, this is a completely different world. I won't get too much into the story, as that's something you want to discover yourself. The character creator will allow you to create the Arisen, your character, as well as your main pawn, which I'll talk about soon. The use of photogrammetry technology enables the creation of what the devs claim to be the most photorealistic characters they've made. They look good, but I definitely wouldn't go that far. More on customization soon. You'll also start out by picking your vocation. You can choose between fighter, archer, thief, and mage, though throughout the story, you'll find quest givers that unlock the advanced classes, warrior, sorcerer, magic, archer, mystic, spearhand, warfarer, and trickster. Those are just the revealed ones. There are even more unrevealed classes that we don't know of yet. This is a quote from the devs, some that you're probably already expecting and some that you would never imagine. The Trickster is already a vocation I'd never imagined for this kind of game. It's a class that uses smoke from a specialized weapon to fight, not by dealing damage, but by confusing enemies, buffing your team, and conjuring illusions to have enemies tossing themselves off cliffs or at each other. So the devs aren't all talk when they say vocations that you would never imagine. Unlike Dragon's Dogma 1, you don't have to grind vocations to unlock the others, though your vocations still gain ranks. You get different skills for each vocation and skills with the weapon you have equipped. The fighter will be able to do a Brad Pitt in Troy-like Sparta jump, for example. On consoles, you can have heavy and light attacks as well as dash and jump on the face buttons, but holding a trigger will change those to four mappable weapon skills. And on another trigger, you have your vocation action and on another, a grab. More on the grab later, but suffice to say, it's very important if you enjoy having fun. You may have noticed that combat feels much more fluid than in Dragon's Dogma 1, and many RPGs for that matter. One of the devs from the Devil May Cry series is working on this game, so you can expect the combat to feel great. Each vocation has their own mechanic. For instance, the warrior can time button presses with strikes to attack faster, and their big, powerful strikes can be charged for some of the biggest damage numbers in the game. The sorcerer has long cast times, but can use quick spell to cast faster at the cost of more stamina. Then you can use Galvanize, a sort of meditate type effect, to recharge quickly. I'll go through every announced vocation and what they can do in another video, so when it's done, it'll be in the link below. So they can all utilize the environment to best their foes. Here we see a Cyclops, a deadly enemy to face early on. Instead of fighting him head on, the player blows up the rocks holding back the water and sweeps it down river like a ring wraith. This isn't a set amount of damage, it's based on the physics and the environment. So its trip doesn't quite kill the creature, but it does major damage. One strike from it is enough to down your main character, so it seems at least at level 7, you need to be skilled enough to bring this beast down. Quick consumption of food, Skyrim-esque, brings you back up and scaling the beast's body like Kratos. By felling the beast, you gain a level. Leveling up grants you stats like health, stamina, max ENC, strength, magic, defense, and magic defense. Enemies can destroy the environment as well. As we see here, a Cyclops destroying trees with its butt stomp-like attack. So you can scale this beast by grabbing it, like shown before, but getting repeated head strikes off will stun it, letting your whole team follow up with damage while it's helpless on the ground. The physics of the game are actually very impressive. Here we see a Cyclops falling against a tree when stunned, but the tree props it up. Then later it's stunned and smashes its head against a cliff face, taking major damage. You'll be able to knock around the smaller enemies, as we see here the player power shotting one off a cliff. Here's another instance where a pawn, completely unprompted, throws a rock at a harpy. Yes, pawns will interact with the environment too, but if you're feeling a little bit frisky, pick up and throw any small enough to carry enemy right off a cliff. 
You can also do this with allies if you're that way inclined. Yes, pawns can and will pick up and throw enemies as well, though I'm not sure that's tied to their stats. So let me take this moment to throw to a quick break. Welcome back. So naturally you can pick a vocation, but you can also highly customize how your character and main pawns look from individual part sizes to fur patterns and thickness. What you've come to expect is here and then some. There are sliders for just about anything. What's interesting, however, is the templates. Here you see five pages of nine basic looks. You pick one and it shows you nine more just like that. So you pick one and are presented with seven more that look just like that. It really nails down your starting point for your base head. I know what you're thinking and yes, you can make monstrosities confirmed by the devs, so think Street Fighter 6 character creator. Notably, height and weight affect different stats on your character, though to what extent I'm not sure. I mentioned you can customize your main pawn, pawns being one of the highlighting features of Dragon's Dogma. They're AI controlled characters who you either customize yourself or get online from other real players own main pawn. These will help narrate the story as well as fight with you to ensure as little UI is needed. For example, your pawns may comment that you need to go into that cave to reach your objective if they have prior knowledge. So you can have three different pawns with you in a party at any given time. According to the devs, over time, your pawn will become a worthy companion on your journey as they learn through their experiences, adventuring with you as well as other players, which will be reflected on their behavior. Having a diverse team of pawns will allow for countless ways to play while lending a sense of multiplayer community to this single player adventure. So it seems as though your pawns will learn from their time in someone else's game, so they may be of better help during quests. Before choosing a pawn from the Rift Stones, you can see a quick snapshot of what they do. These pawns will be rated by the community and have their own inclinations, specializations, quests and experience in their creator's game. Pawns are mainly there to help you fight and can be revived if down. When they are, they get healed to the Arisen's current HP and get back to fighting. Your pawn's vocation will matter. Archers, for example, will help you hit and knock down flying enemies which the warriors and thieves can't reach. Here we see a mage cast an ice then a lightning spell which makes it easier for the melee only thief to get hits in. They're also handy specifically against harpies as harpies can put you to sleep and mages can heal. Pawns can specialize. We see here that learning to translate elvish is one of the specializations named Woodland Wordsmith. So if your pawn is nearby, the language will turn from unknowable to understandable. We also see this pawn has a calm inclination and has a personal pawn quest. Seems easy, just give him a raspberry and get two cranberries in return. I don't blame him, I'd gladly give up all my cranberries for raspberries. My favorite use of pawns though is the fact that they help with inventory management. The more you carry, the faster your stamina will drain when using action. Pawns can carry your burdens. Here we see a pawn opening a chest and taking the loot out, making it so you don't need to take out the loot yourself, fill up and transfer your inventory to them every 5 minutes if you're a hoarder like me that is. Pawns are also under risk of a disease-like condition called the Dragon's Plague. This affects them as they travel between worlds, so as you get pawns from other players. The interesting thing though is that this disease doesn't weaken your pawns, but rather makes them display remarkable performance and become conspicuously bold in their speech and behavior. According to folklore, when the symptoms of Dragon's Plague reach a terminal stage, it will result in a devastating calamity, but the ferocity of these claims is unclear, so it might have a story-based consequence. Perhaps they change into a dragon, repeating the cycle. The new race, the Beastron, fear the pawns because they think they'll bring some sort of misfortune to the world. So those two things could be connected. So like mentioned, if a pawn with knowledge of your current quest accompanies you, they can guide you through the quest to key areas rather than you relying on your map. In fact, your map rarely shows any points of interest and you won't see quest markers over NPC heads. Here we see a pawn asking if we should seek out a young man from before and one of the pawns saying they know the way and to follow them. Shall we seek out the young man from the other day? I know the way, follow me. It's up to you to discover the world with guidance of NPCs and your pawns. In addition to main story objectives, you can receive a variety of quests by speaking with the inhabitants of this world and building relationships and favor with them. More often than not though, NPCs will approach you with quests. Of course, it's up to the player to accept or to make use of the pawn's guidance. 
In this world, travelers, merchants, soldiers, and other folk go about their daily lives without you, preoccupied by their own objectives and motive. At times, they may lead you to a quest by approaching you and asking you for a favor. So expect a dynamic questing system. You might be thinking Skyrim and the similarities don't stop there. The devs don't want you to simply fast travel everywhere. You can fast travel between points, but need to expend an expensive item. You can also pay much less to take an ox cart to a distant location, but there is a chance you will be ambushed. Walking is the cheapest way, but the most deadly. Don't think that quests that require you to go with someone somewhere will teleport you instantly when you accept the quest. Here we see the guards offering to escort you to the capital. You don't just teleport, you walk and fight with them all the way there. This very much reminds me of Skyrim. There's also a day and night cycle, and it seems as though skeletons and other night-bound enemies will come out in the darkness. You want to be sure you rest at an inn or at a campsite often because as you take damage, your max health will diminish, only being restored while resting. If you rest at a campsite, you can undertake some cooking and get some buffs as well. But like with traveling by ox, there's a risk to camping in that you can be ambushed. Look at that meat detail, damn. Now we have some serious buffs going on. Speaking of buffs, I might take this opportunity to quickly get some food and cut to a break. So while previewing the game, IGN claims to be ambushed by a griffin while resting, one they fought before, but before killing it, it flew off. So events will be dynamic based on what you've done in the world, and if anything, it sounds like you should put yourself in positions to be ambushed just to see what will happen. They mentioned that everything feels like it comes at a cost versus benefit. Like mentioned, you can use an item, fairy stones, to quick travel, but they cost a whopping 10,000 gold versus the only 250 gold for a potion from the same vendor. If you travel by foot, it's the cheapest way, but the most risky. Should you push on, even though you've taken a beating, or backtrack to rest at an inn? Should you risk a big fight for big material rewards? Dragon's Dogma 2 tries to make you think of the risks. If the fight isn't going particularly well, you can revive your allies by holding a button over them, which is pretty standard, but you can also move their body to a safer place before attempting the revive. Even your pawns will take part in moving bodies for you. Keep in mind though, your max health will stay lowered until you rest. They also mentioned that it felt like the most recent Zelda game when it came to exploring. The act of venturing outside of city walls is unpredictable, enticing, and dangerous. Dragon Dogma 2's map is reported to be four times the size of Dragon Dogma 1, which was already massive. But if this is any indication, the game will have tons to do. IGN claimed it felt big but dense, with lots of encounters on and off the beaten path. The devs really wanted to help you appreciate the scale of the game. We can see the game is truly beautiful, with exceptional draw distance on consoles, and assumed even better on PC. You have to give them props for the amazing water effects as well. This all happens with zero loading screens between nature, towns, and even jumping into rift shards to get yourself a new pawn. So you can jump in, hire a pawn, send gifts to the person you got the pawn from, and jump out and continue all without loading a thing. Keep in mind it's running on the RE engine, which was used for recent Resident Evil games, so I'm not sure how it will hold up with a large open world like this, but it seems to be doing very well. In this open world, you have quite a few distinctly different regions. An example is Vermund, the Kingdom of Humanity. This is where the Arisen rules as king. It's the first nation the protagonist explores. Built on a lush green land, the king and the nobles reside within the kingdom's fortified city. The town where the commoners reside sprawls around the castle. Currently, the queen regent, Dissa, supports a false arisen. Vermund is a scene of many conspiracies to seize the throne. Then we have Bathal, the nation of Bistrin, the other race you can make your main character. The steep canyons still hold ancient ruins, and cities have been constructed amongst them. The culture, customs, and beliefs of the Bethal have been nurtured by their harsh, natural environment and differ from those of Vermont. In Bethal, pawns are seen as the source of misfortune. Instead of the Arisen, the citizens worship the Lambert Flame to ward off calamity, with the Empress Nadinia at its center. Now we've mentioned misfortune and calamities before. Finally, we have the Sacred Arbor, the home of the Elves. In addition to humans and Beastrin, a race called the Elves also inhabit this world. They prefer not to interact with other races and live in the remote village of the Sacred Arbor. The Elves speak their own language, which makes communication with them difficult. 
but like we mentioned, your paws can specialize in understanding elvish. There are more than just humans, beasts, and elves in this world. There are tons of enemy types. From the smaller goblins, hobgoblins, and knackers, who will come at you with numbers and very humanoid tactics, to creatures you'd expect like wolves. But you also have harpies, the lizard-like saurians, chimera, golems, ogres, slimes, skeletons, and other undead-like rites, cyclopses, minotaurs, the colossally big talos, the mysterious Dullahan and deadly drakes. A favorite enemy of mine is the Saurons, really cool lizard-like creatures that you can chop the tails off of. They come at you on all fours and pop up and attack you like a humanoid. We know Dragon's Dogma has some climbing and weak point attack mechanics, so fighting the Talos will be most likely the most God of War feeling enemy yet. This seems like a quest event, though it's doubtful you'll just see the monsters walking around the world, but the world is huge and anything could happen. It seems like stabbing any old part will do nothing. You have to attack the very obvious blood-like red crystals coming out of its impaled parts. How do you get up there? Well, you can scale the mountains next to it and grab onto flying beasts to drop down from above, or wait until it grabs onto the side of cliffs and... Catch a Slashing the weak point enough spews out a blood-like substance by the tons. Speaking of grappling, like mentioned, it's extremely valuable to grab onto enemies and attack their weak points. As you can see, attacking the eyes of this Cyclops keeps its attention on the pain and stops it swinging around and killing your team. Just be careful when climbing, as some enemies can counter you, in this case, with their butt. Here we see a Drake. While it's not as big as the dragon, it has a powerful breath attack and is surprisingly nimble. The warrior gets on his back and charges a big swing stunning it. Here's the Dullahan, absolutely wrecking a team with magic and a powerful swing. But by casting a powerful spell next to another magic user, the sorcerer sends down the media quicker than they would have alone. Here we see an ogre. It grabs you and runs off with you, separating you from your pawns, showing off the variety of enemy tactics we can expect. So the ogre can also drop kick you to open a fight. You'll notice it has multiple health bars indicating different stages of the fight either getting deadlier the more desperate it is, or reverse, becoming more sluggish. The, enemy's movements have grown sluggish. the player figures it's better to wait for an opening and use the high ground to jump onto the beast, plunging a sword into its head and doing huge damage. Naturally, the beast throws the player off quite a distance. This brings the player prone, unable to get up in time to dodge a kick from the beast. Thankfully, the party mage heals the player. The player gets thrown around some more until an ox caravan happens along and the guard joins the fight. This is an instance of the world dynamically helping you. Eventually, you'll no doubt fight a dragon. Yes, it does feel like Skyrim. So that's everything we know about Dragon's Dogma 2. Are you more or less excited now? Did I miss anything? Let me know below. Be sure to hit that bell and do the typical YouTube stuff. It means a lot. Until next time, ciao friends.